little lady made these. I did, sir. Sort of a lonesome place out here, Pete. Unless you get in the swing of things. Were there gay folks in the Wild West? Well, that's a silly question. Of course there were. It's just a matter of how secretive they had to be. But that silly question was ignited last week in a Twitter firestorm over the 2021 film The Power of the Dog, from the trailer of which we just heard a clip. The film stars Benedict Cumberbatch as a ranch cowboy in Montana in 1925, and the plot revolves around tension between Cumberbatch's tough, hardened, masculine character and a young, thin, somewhat effeminate boy, played by Cody Smith McPhee. And the film raises questions of what it meant to be a man in the American West and what desires were and were not allowed there. The film won three Golden Globes for Best Motion Picture, Best Director, and Best Supporting Actor. But last week, famed Western actor Sam Elliott went on Mark Barron's podcast and gave a slightly different take. What, did you see Power of the Dog? Did you watch that movie? Yeah, you want to talk about that piece of <laughs> Oh, no. You didn't like that one? <laughs> no. And Elliot goes on to drop no less than 21 F-bombs in describing the film. Yeah. Specifically, he laments its homoerotics, quoting a critic. And there was a a review, not a review, but a, a clip. Blurb. A clip, yeah. Yeah. And it talked about the uh, evisceration of the American myth. Huh. And I thought... What the f now, the critic in question, Monala Dargis, was actually praising the film with that phrase, but Elliot takes it in a decidedly different direction. The evisceration of the American West. I mean, they made it look like, what are, those, what are all those dancers, those guys in New York that wear bow ties and not much else? Uh-huh. Remember them from back in the day? Oh, the Chippendales? Yeah. Yeah. That's what all these f cowboys in that movie looked like. Uh-huh. They're all running around in shaps and no shirts. There's all these illusions of homosexuality yeah. Yeah. throughout the f***ing movie. Yeah. I think that's what the movie's about. Yeah. Well. Huh. Okay. So these comments ignited a Twitter firestorm, with some folks calling Elliot homophobic and others saying, now he's just being honest. And you could probably guess which side I'm on in that fight. But actually, I'm less interested in condemnation and more interested in what the guy even means by these comments and what that means for our perceptions of the Wild West. Because, first of all, seriously, I don't even know where Elliot gets this Chippendales thing. I thought the film's homoerotics were relatively subdued by 2022 standards. So, I don't know. I don't want to give anything away. So, I guess I'll just leave it at that. But... I don't know what he's talking about. Anyway, I'm more intrigued by the critic's phrase, the evisceration of the American myth, and what Eliot thinks that means, and why depiction of a homoerotic relationship might be so eviscerating that it causes him to drop 21 F-bombs. Because if he means unfaithfulness to what the West was really like, well, that's one thing. That's history. We can look at historical records and see if there really were folks who loved others of the same sex. But if he means what he says, the American myth, well, I tell you what, he's kind of got a point. Because the American myth in which modern American masculinity is rooted is that the wilderness of the West toughened a guy up and made him a man, and specifically a straight man. Yet this movie shows a tough-as-nails cowboy in the rough Montana wilderness who nevertheless does not fit that mold. So yes, Mr. Elliot, this is the evisceration of the American myth. If that's what you mean, then you and the critic you were quoting, well, you got a point. But also, sorry to break it to you, Mr. Elliot, Yes, the West was gay. Now, how gay was it? And what was it like for men who loved other men and women who loved other women and those who defied their assigned sex? Well, that's what we're talking about in today's episode. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Mm -hmm. 
History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. I'd like to thank our Patreon patron, Amy Schmelzer, for making this episode possible. Hey folks, this is part of our ongoing series, Sex in the Wild West. I've been hard at work at our installment looking at the West from Native American perspectives and was planning to run a showcase episode for my other podcast, Dead Ideas, today. But then I was alerted to Sam Elliott's timely comments, which have been blowing up on Twitter. So thank you to listener and friend John for bringing this to my attention. So given that, I thought it, it's probably time to set the record straight on what the West was really like for same-sex desire. Now, I did address this in the first episode of our series, where I confessed to having a difficult time finding actual hard evidence of homosexual relationships. However, since then, I have found more. Now, I want to give credit to a great YouTuber by the name of Kaz Rowe, who did an episode on this and gave some examples that I had overlooked. Also, historian Peter Bogue, who we heard from quite a bit in our episode on cross-dressers in the West, catalogs quite a few examples of what could be considered same-sex desire. And I only say could be considered because, well, in the case of historical cross-dressers, it's often unclear what they would have considered their own sex to be. I mean, in some cases, they may have been perfectly comfortable with their assigned sex, but in others, not so much. And in that latter case, I mean, would they have considered their relationships to be same-sex or opposite sex? It's a little unclear. But that really only becomes a problem if we try to apply our 21st century lens to an era that didn't share our same sexual categories. What is ultimately more important is who those folks were and how they lived their lives in the Wild West. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So let's take a look at some of these examples and discover whether or not the power of the dog gets it right, historically speaking, and what that means for the quote-unquote evisceration of the American myth. So what was it really like for those who loved others of the same sex in the Wild West? Well, first off, it's unlikely that it was some kind of gay free-for-all. Sam Elliott's imagined Chippendales dancer scene was neither in the movie nor in historical reality. Although same-sex desire did exist, one did still have to be circumspect. And this is illustrated in our first story, which features an Easterner who travels to the Rocky Mountains and provides us an impression of the attitude encountered there. Historian Peter Bogue writes, Earl Lind, who sometimes went by the alter ego Jenny June, found, quote, the adolescent cowboys and miners of the Rockies the most prejudiced against effeminate males, unquote, that he had ever come across. A self-described homosexual from New York City who also took great satisfaction in dressing as a woman, Lind explained that sometime around the turn of the 20th century, his news business employers dispatched him to the Rockies, quote, to write up an unusual affair transpiring, unquote. He traveled, quote, in a caravan with 50 men of the roughest type, cowboys, miners, etc., unquote. And although he went entirely dressed as a man, he could not altogether hide his effeminate nature. Soon his fellow travelers, quote, began to heap up insults, particularly taking pains to refer to me within my hearing by the obscene term most often used by roughs for a girl boy, unquote. Now, Lynn does not provide exactly what that obscene term was, indicating that it was likely a curse word deemed unsuitable for print. So, so far, this depiction provided by Lynn fits with that scene in The Power of the Dog, as well as with most of Western history in Europe and the Americas, where the primary motive for ridicule was unmanliness and not necessarily unstraightliness, I guess you could say. Gender presentation was more important than who you had sex with for most of Western history, and Lynn suffers specifically for appearing effeminate. 
Nevertheless, after Lin flashes his national journalistic credentials to the fellows that he's riding with, he was treated with a bit more kindness, but he soon found the limits of that respect. He eventually befriended one Wyoming cowboy who claimed to have traveled with the Buffalo Bill show and who confided all manner of personal information in him. Lind finally felt comfortable enough to confess his sexuality and gender proclivities. But much to his, quote, surprise almost to my death, unquote, Lind explained, his friend, quote, jilted me with an unparalleled display of horror, unquote. Now, it's interesting to me here that Lind even considered confiding in this Wyoming man, which speaks to the relative freedom that he was used to back in New York, as well as the potential freedom he expected to find at least among friends out west. Nevertheless, he miscalculates and is harshly rejected. Now, whether it is specifically the homosexuality or the cross-dressing that incites horror is not exactly clear here, as the two are lumped together in Lynn's account. In general, the American West was one of the last eras, really, where sexuality was an act and not an identity, and presenting masculinely was more important than who you slept with. However, modern sexual identities were already being formulated among sexologists in Germany and England, in the late 19th century, precipitating a shift in public perception as the era of the cowboy was drawing to the close at the turn of the century. Regardless, same-sex love did take place, and one notable example is the one mentioned in our first episode of this series. William Drummond Stewart, a Scotsman who traveled the American West extensively in the 1830s, commissioned a pair of buffalo-themed wooden chairs, which are now on display at the Autry Museum. The chairs likely commemorate the intimate relationship that he enjoyed in the American West with French-Canadian Antoine Clément. Another story of note regards Joseph Gilligan of Denver, reported on in 1895. When Gilligan became the subject of a burglary and forgery investigation, authorities discovered in his hotel room a wardrobe of women's clothing and accoutrements, as well as a certain booklet, Bogue describes. The police uncovered a booklet kept by Gilligan containing the names of prominent Denver men and tell-all letters of a sexual nature. The press quoted from the letters, specifically pointing out the, quote, endearing terms, unquote, contained therein and that were exchanged between men. Now, of particular interest here is an additional comment made in the papers. Quote, Gilligan is very girlish in his actions and his talk, but does not appear to worry over the publicity of his life and seems to gather sympathy from the fact, as he tells it, that Denver has others like himself, unquote. It is noteworthy and interesting to see that Denver seemed to boast something of a queer community. In some places, may even have had enough of a community to support male brothels. According to historian Chris Packard, a recent search of the Dodge City Police Court docket, 1885-1888, to 1888, reveals evidence of male prostitutes arrested during a sweep of what were termed, quote, houses of ill fame and assignation, unquote. On the same night, both Howard Hines and John Smith paid a $5 fine plus seven fifty in court costs for being, quote, an inmate of a house of ill fame, unquote, language that is identical to that used for female prostitutes Myrtle Glover and Mabel Watson. Other men arrested on the same date were charged with, quote, vagrancy, unquote, and fined $10. Why did the court single out Hines and Smith from other men arrested that night and convict them of identical crimes as two female prostitutes? Why did Hines and Smith pay the fines and admit their guilt? The dearth of historical evidence should not be construed as the absence of it. So what Packard is saying there is this may not be hard evidence, but it is kind of evidence, isn't it? Now, if Dodge City, Kansas did, in fact, have a male brothel, that suggests a base of clientele sizable enough to support it. On the other hand, the community might not have been large enough for its members to feel truly free, even in their own gathering spots, like maybe this male brothel, because most frontier towns were not big enough to support the kind of protective anonymity that was offered in, say, London or Paris or Berlin at this time. 
as historian William Benjamin relates, Only Philadelphia was large enough to provide men loving men with the anonymity of numbers. In rural areas, among the lower classes, it might be possible for two men to live their lives together working the same farm or pursuing the same craft. But in more urban areas, especially among the socially prominent, whose stories are the ones most likely to be preserved in surviving documents, heterosexual marriage was the only acceptable goal. Now, Benjamin here seems to be considering Philadelphia, I guess, a frontier town. Otherwise, clearly he'd be mentioning coastal cities like New York and Boston, which were far larger at the time. But nevertheless, his point does stand. Frontier towns were vanishingly small in comparison to these cities and could not provide the cover of anonymity. Thus, gay communities, if they existed, would likely have been quite clandestine indeed, and you might have been more likely to encounter same-sex love among the sort of rural, subdued private relationships that we actually see in a film like The Power of the Dog. Now, a few other historical cases are worth noting. For example, Ava Lind, not to be confused with the Earl Lind mentioned earlier, cross-dressed as a woman in Colfax, Washington Territory in the 1880s, and received numerous offers of marriage, reportedly even committing to one man. And similarly, another cross-dresser known as George Todd of Omaha, Nebraska, was arrested in 1891 for attempting to, quote, make a mash on his own sex, unquote. So that's quite a few examples already there. But so far, we've only been dwelling upon men who loved other men, or those assigned male, at least, who loved men. But the West was also home to women who loved other women, and those assigned female who loved women. For example, there was Shirley Martin, who dressed in masculine attire. Historian Peter Bogue writes, Lake City, Iowa's Shirley Martin, whom papers interestingly reported to have had a feminine appearance, nevertheless dated women, having taken them to picture shows and other amusements, as well as having treated them to ice cream. And although in a 1912 news article Martin claimed never to have received a proposal of marriage, she all the same asserted that, quote, I might have won a wife if I had tried very hard, though, unquote. So that's Shirley Martin. And then there was a certain Blanche, we don't know her last name, from Aspen, Colorado. An 1889 article reports that the 28-year-old Blanche proposed to marry her 17-year-old cousin, Belle. But apparently this was a one-sided affair, as the young girl complained. Bogue writes that Blanche, quote, Hugs and kisses and squeezes me nearly to death. She won't let me out of her arms after we go to bed and presses me so close to her that I can hardly breathe. She says if I don't marry her, she'll kill me and talks so strange that I have grown afraid of her. When questioned by her uncle, Blanche responded calmly that she indeed loved Belle, quote, just as strong as the love of man ever was for a woman, and I am ready to prove it with my heart's blood, unquote. Another example comes from Denver with a certain John Hill. A 1911 article declared that for two years he had been, quote, doing all the work of a man and never shirking when it was grinding and heavy, wearing the clothes of a man, bearing the name of a man, and making love to a young woman with true masculine ardor, unquote. But a startling about face then occurred when Hill went to prove up his homestead claim. A homestead is when you claim the land that you build on and then you have to actually qualify for it. So you've got to go to the courthouse and prove up, as they say. Now the thing was, he had taken out this claim under his given name of Helen Fisher. And so he was obliged to go into the restroom and emerge in feminine attire, which caused quite a surprise to the locals. And he later told a newspaper, quote, It was the only thing to do. A woman would not have felt safe out there, and so I just had to do it. Now, the notion that women might have to dress as men to survive was a common trope at the time. And so maybe it was true, but then again, maybe it was a cover story told to the press to conceal deeper questions about gender and sexuality. Yet another example comes from Hunter Joseph Lobdell, 
Having been assigned female at birth, Lobdell suffered through an abusive marriage before leaving to take up a male identity in Minnesota in the 1850s. When his secret was discovered, however, local county officials sent him packing, sending him back east. Then, in Pennsylvania, Lobdell attained a teaching position. Kind of an odd transition, going from a frontier hunter to a university teacher, but oh well. In any case, Bogue writes, Reportedly popular with all the local young women, many of whom enrolled in his classes, by the end of this first term of teaching, Lobdell had earned the love of and an engagement to one such pupil. The night before the planned wedding, however, a rival for the girl's affections, who had come into information about Lobdell's female alter ego, planned to capture his opponent, tar and feather him, and then run him out of town on the rails. But before this nefarious scheme could be hatched, Lobdell's betrothed discovered the plans. Notwithstanding her reported mortification upon learning of her engagement to a woman, she nevertheless warned her fiancé for whom she yet retained feelings. Lobdell safely fled in the night. And for our final example, there is Oregon's Alan Hart, born in 1890 as Lucille Hart. Always considering himself a boy, Hart nevertheless presented as a girl all the way into the college years, where Hart met and fell in love with classmate Ava Cushman. Bogue writes, Hart and Cushman were inseparable by day, typically attending all functions in each other's company, and they usually spent one night of the week together. Early in their relationship, they engaged in petting, but in time, they became intensely sexual. During the summers when Cushman was away, Hart daily wrote love letters to her. Now later, Hart began experimenting with men's clothing and habits, such as drinking and smoking, and unfortunately, Cushman found this intolerable. They continued their relationship on for some years, but eventually drifted apart. So these examples clearly illustrate that lovers of the same sex could and did make their way in the Wild West. That doesn't mean, however, that it was easy. No doubt there are many, many more cases lost to history simply because of the secrecy that often had to be kept due to endemic homophobia. And in a few cases, it was so intolerable that stories ended in tragedy. Now, folks, here I should post a trigger warning. These next three stories do involve suicide, so you can skip ahead a few minutes if you feel it necessary, and I'll add in a little bit of music before and after so you can see when we're done with that. So the first of the tragic stories that we have for today tells of a laundress following Custer's 7th Cavalry Division, one Mrs. Nash, we don't know her first name. Libby Custer, the wife of General Custer, writes of Mrs. Nash extensively in her book Boots and Saddles, praising her skill and her sense of decor. Mrs. Nash married three times, and only upon her death was it discovered that she had the anatomy associated with males. Her last marriage to soldier John Noonan was apparently a happy one. They were together three years before Noonan's discharge in 1877, who promptly re-enlisted, even though reduced to the rank of corporal, and then carried on with Mrs. Nash. Now, after her secret was exposed upon her death, however, Noonan found himself taunted harshly by the other soldiers and harassed by newspapers. One reporter asked if he had been, quote, a husband to her with all that the name implies, unquote. To which Noonan replied that yes, he had, but he had thought her a woman all along, and they had even expected a child at one point, though it came to naught. Now, whether Noonan could really have been that oblivious to Mrs. Nash's situation, or whether he was simply too ashamed to admit the truth of the matter, is a matter of debate. In any case, the shame caught up to him in the end whereupon the story takes a dark turn. About a month after his beloved Nash's death, Noonan took his own life. Whatever went on between lovers of the same sex in the Wild West, it was not without the burden of prejudice. In Noonan's case, the public ridicule was enough to do him in. Unfortunately, he was not the only one to suffer such a fate. A similar story can be found in the New Mexico couple Portia Doyle 
and Jessie Elizabeth Wrigley. When Doyle, a governess, married her employer's brother, a new governess was brought in to replace her. Now, Doyle and the new woman, Wrigley, became fast friends, quote-unquote, with the habit of spending every Saturday and Sunday together. Soon, Portia left her husband, citing only that she no longer loved him. After that, in 1891, word arrived that the two had been found dead. Bogue writes, They neatly folded their cloaks as pillows, pinned letters to their dresses, and lay down in each other's arms. The coroner's report confirmed the deaths as voluntary. Jessie first shot Portia through the heart, and then turned the weapon on herself, piercing her own heart as well. Now, while there is no indisputable proof, Bogue strongly suspects that the two were lovers, and found it impossible to live apart as their society demanded. Our final story of tragedy is the well-documented case of John Chaffee and Jason Chamberlain. The two met in Massachusetts, then headed to California for the 1849 gold rush. There they lived for 50 years together, neither ever married or left any evidence in their diaries of desiring female companions. But in 1903, Chaffee fell victim to a painful skin disease that took him to San Francisco for treatment. Meanwhile, Chamberlain, back at their lodge, fell despondent. A guest at their lodge wrote, His meditative, absent look and daydreams indicate that his mind, thoughts, and anxieties are in Chaffee while he lingers in the East Bay Sanatorium in Oakland. A love could not miss his sweetheart more. Now Chaffee succumbed to the disease later that year, and upon hearing news of Chaffee's death, Chamberlain could not go on. Tying to his toe a shotgun trigger by a length of string, he shot himself in the head on his front porch. A neighbor reported that they had intended to be buried together, but their wishes were not carried out. Now from these stories, it is plain to see that, yeah, the West was no easy place to live for those who loved others of the same sex, but it was home to them nonetheless. <laughs> The West was no playground of Chippendale dancers, but in a very real sense, yes, the West was gay. Such men, women, and those who defied their assigned sex made their way in the West no less than anyone else, and their stories deserve to be told too. So out of all the dozens upon dozens upon dozens of Western films out there, why can't one of them here or there highlight the true-to-history presence of same-sex desire. Why does that represent such a threat to folks like Sam Elliott? That's what belies the homophobia in Elliott's reaction to the film The Power of the Dog. He seems to object to the fact that one movie tells the story of a single homoerotic relationship as if that story is somehow illegitimate. And he seems to feel that it delegitimizes the story of the West as he knows and loves it. And to express this, he rather clumsily appropriates that critic's phrase, the evisceration of the American myth. And he drops 21 F-bombs in the process. <laughs> but you know what? Frankly, he's right. About the myth part, I mean, not the F-bombs, I guess. I'm not sure that Elliot realizes why he's right, <laughs> but he is right. It does eviscerate the American myth. The myth of American manliness, going all the way back to Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis, is that we were born and bred on the frontier, such a harsh place that we had no choice but to toughen up and become real men, quote-unquote. And that made American men what we are today. That's the myth. Now, the presence of queer folk on the frontier, whether on the silver screen or in real history, threatens that myth. Now, to be clear, the myth is just downright false. As the series has painstakingly shown, it is a lie that propped up the new 20th century notion of heteronormativity. It has little to do with what the West was really like and everything to do with how straight folks in the century following reacted to the new modern notion of sexuality as identity. See, around the turn of the century, 
as same-sex lovemaking transitioned from something that you did to evidence of something that you were, i.e. an identity, and as that notion trickled down from the sexologists in the university to the wider population, heterosexuals felt the need to starkly demarcate the boundaries between them and everyone else. The Western film played a role in service to that end. It came to embody what the majority culture felt a real man, quote-unquote, was like, rugged, tough, and thoroughly straight. That's the myth of American manliness, and that, I think, is what Eliot really feels is eviscerated by the power of the dog. And that part is true. It does expose the fact that the West was not entirely straight. My only beef with Eliot is that this is not to be decried, but rather praised, as the critic he quoted originally intended. I mean, if the American myth isn't true to history, oh well, try again, right? And that's pretty much what this whole podcast is about. This show is about exploring the incredible variety of sex and gender norms across time such that simplistic myths like this one can't help but wither away. And you know, now that I think about it, honestly, I'd love to hear what Elliot thinks about this show. Maybe I should ask Mark Marin to have him back on to find out. And if the power of the dog got 21 F-bombs, I wonder how many I'd get. <laughs> Well, that's all I've got for you today, folks. I hope you learned something. I certainly did. And you know, everything said today only addresses really just one side of the Wild West, the settler side. But there was also, of course, the side of its native inhabitants. And that is a much more complex and nuanced story. And that's what we will dive into in the next installment of our Sex in the Wild West series. That's what's planned tentatively for May. Meanwhile, for April next month, we've got a special treat coming up for you folks. An interview with famed actress Alexandra Billings from the award-winning TV series Transparent. Billings sits down with me to discuss her experience as a trans woman, an actress, and a teacher. That's what's coming up next month. In the meantime, if you like what we're doing on this show, you can support us by subscribing, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait drawn in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you as a rough writing or smooth writing or whatever kind of writing you darn well please cowpoke making your way on the frontier. Or whatever you want. I'll make you look awesome. I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash btnewberg. All right, folks. I'll see you next time. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.